Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome uh, to the open forum uh, dedicated uh, to the issue of uh, achieving the sustainable development goals uh, through secure digital transformation. Uh, this open forum uh, is organized by the government of Sweden. So thank you for joining us here, and thank you uh, to those of us uh, joining us uh, online. Uh, what we will do today uh, is to kind of discuss how the issues of cyber security can be mainstreamed in the development agenda. It's a topic that is very close uh, to many uh, of the partners of this project that we would be uh, introducing here today uh, and uh, that we hope to get inputs uh, from you on. So uh, just to recap, uh, this project on mainstreaming cybersecurity in development uh, uh, has the following partners. It's the government of Sweden, uh, as I have mentioned, uh, it's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, uh, the GFC, it's the International Telecommunications Union, uh, the ITU, uh, and last but not least, uh, Microsoft. So welcome on behalf of all of the partners in this consortium. Um, to set us off, maybe just a few general remarks. So cybersecurity is often decoupled from other uh, development interventions due to lack of awareness, understanding of how to integrate it, uh, or dual use uh, technology concerns. Uh, however, uh, what uh, you know, all of the partners, and as we have understood, also many other around these issues, um, uh, you know, have understood that. Um, sustainable digital transformation and cybersecurity, uh, there are some vital cross-cutting needs there. And for this reason, today, uh, we are formally uh, launching this work stream uh, that we have been working on uh, uh, together to facilitate a frank and inclusive discussion among stakeholders uh, and distill their recommendations into a multi-stakeholder compendium uh, that we are planning to uh, launch uh, later this year and um, uh, we, will, uh, we will share more details on later. So uh, to this end, uh, we really plan uh, to bring various stakeholders to a series of workshops. One of them is considered uh, as this one uh, happening at the IGF. And just to give you a little teaser of the issues that we are planning to discuss, uh, it's issues such as the role of cybersecurity in supporting uh, safe and secure digital transformation, the importance of digital development as an enabling function uh, to achieving uh, the SDGs, uh, what are some of the lessons learned uh, from past and ongoing cyber capacity building projects? How can we use some concrete goals or checklists and indicators for the implementation of UN cyber norms? Uh, mainstreaming cyber capacity building with various development programs and funds, uh, and also uh, the role of diplomacy in creating institutions and mandates uh, to support uh, cyber uh, mainstreaming. So uh, these are some of the issues that we will be uh, discussing today. We do hope that we will have a lively discussion uh, that will then uh, be reflected in the compendium uh, in, the, in the making. So uh, that was just a very brief introduction of the topic. And now let me introduce also the discussions that we will have uh, to, uh, to take us through that. So uh, I will start. Uh, on my left, uh, at the end of the table, uh, we have uh, Christopher Painter, who is the president of the GFC uh, Foundation Board. Uh, we continue with Yasmin Idrissi from, uh, from the International Telecommunications Union. We also have Johan Eckerhult uh, from the Swedish uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Michael Karamanian from uh, Microsoft. My name is uh, Teresa Horeisova, also with the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, and it will be my pleasure to be your moderator alongside uh, my colleague Alan Sabanlong, who is joining us uh, from uh, the Philippines, who will be serving as a bridge with the online audience. And I do hope also uh, His Excellency Mokhtar Yedali, uh, ex-minister uh, from Mauritania, joining us from there at hopefully 4 a.m. in the morning. I don't know if we have a confirmation if Mr. Mokhtar is with us. He is. So very good. Good morning, Mokhtar. I really appreciate you being here. So uh, let's get started. Now, each of uh, our panelists will give some brief reflections, and then we will go into the discussion. And uh, if you allow me, I would like to start with you, uh, Johan. Uh, 
there is a reason uh, why the government uh, of Sweden has considered this issue uh, of importance. So could you maybe uh, kick us off on how you see the importance of digital development uh, as an enabling function for the SDGs? Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, and, and, and also thanks to, to, to all the partners from GCFE and ITU and Microsoft uh, here today. I, thi I think from the Swedish government perspective, uh, we have had uh, a, a long development journey from a poor agro country to, to a relatively industrialized and digitalized uh, country. And I think that journey has been able to do with trust. I think that is where we're coming from. So, and what we have felt and seen, and I think we've all seen even more so with, with the COVID and the pandemic, that core parts of our everyday life and our governance functions are digitalized. So creating trust and security in how we share information, how we communicate, how we deal with this across borders have become an essential part on a functioning society, on a functioning economy, on a functioning development. So from our point of view, that is why we see a very strong link with the social uh, SDGs and building cybersecurity. Because if you take an issue for like information or disinformation, for example, it's, it's, it's about understanding believing, trusting in the sources that you have, those things are, are key uh, w when we look at it. Uh, and I think also for, for, an, for an industry to grow, um, we today buy and sell things across borders. If I want to sell something in another country, I would like to be sure that the thing I'm buying is the what I'm ordering. I'd also want to make sure that my credit card or whatever I used to pay is not skimmed along the way. So in that, I think we have a very key issue. And I think especially for small and medium sized enterprises in developing countries, being able to have that security and that broadness around the system is key for having the opportunity to grow and to develop. And I think that uh, for us are uh, very, very key key things. And I think when, when we are looking at it, I think one needs to raise the awareness of cybersecurity uh, uh, because it might sound technical, but it is essential to allowing the other aspects uh, of this trust building to get to the, uh, to, to the SDGs. Uh, and I think I'm very extra happy that we are all of us here to together because I think in order to achieve that trust, we need to work together. I mean, we as governments need the help of the industry with Microsoft. We need to cooperate together in international organization and we need a civil society and the experts uh, like the, uh, like you, Teresa, is, uh, to, to work on, on taking this forward. And we cannot do it alone. And I think digital is one of those things, we all know it. It doesn't stop at borders, so we need to do this uh, together. Um, I think I'll, uh, I'll think I'll stop here a little bit. Maybe maybe I can touch a little bit on, on how, how we see it. I think, what, what does that mean then? I think, well, it means that we need to have common rules. We need to have the tools for implementation. We need to have the tools for monitoring. Uh, and in the end, we will probably also have the resources to remedy when, when things go wrong. So I think you need all those aspects. And I think, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, ITU is doing an excellent job on, on, on the monitoring part. I mean, we all try to help in, in providing our input from, from a national perspective in, in so that we can see what is needed. Uh, to we can do that gap analysis. And I mean, you... Uh, from uh, GCFE, I mean, and you are, you're pr producing the knowledge base that we need to get there. And the industry is, 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 is a key partner because they are actually providing the fundamentals of which we work through. And we as governments try to find the right balance between regulation and governance and, and getting that right. Um, so, so I think those are the things that, that, that we are 
uh, working on and, and also, to be very frank, also struggling with because I think that the challenge of doing this is, of course, that it, it needs that cooperation among us, but also in governments and, and to get all the different co uh, key partners to talk together. Uh, so I think those are a little bit how we see the, the basic the basic points of why this is important and why need we need to work together um, in, 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 in this setup. So I think wh what we are looking for is, is to learn from you and how we, how we can do this better and, and uh, very, very much interested in hearing, hearing your views on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Johan. Uh, also for stressing kind of the multi-stakeholder um, uh, importance uh, of these discussions. There is also no coincidence why this consortium of this project has been set up uh, 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 the way uh, the way it has been. Uh, and you know, later on, if our if our time allows. Um, Having you as a diplomat uh, in Geneva, uh, it would be really useful also to hear some reflections from you on how the development and cyber security worlds actually meet uh, at this uh, center of diplomacy. But let's leave it uh, for later. Um, as I have uh, mentioned in the opening remarks, uh, we have had. Uh, two consultations already uh, with um, uh, at various contexts, uh, at various venues. Uh, the first one uh, was happening in July in New York uh, during uh, the open-ended uh, working group. Uh, the second one uh, was held uh, uh, about two weeks ago, uh, virtually uh, in cooperation with also the Swedish uh, uh, International Development Agency, SIDA, uh, on really trying to bring more of the development practitioners uh, into this discourse. And uh, we have learned quite a lot. Uh, some, uh, let's say, the concerns uh, or recommendations that we have heard in these consultations were expected. Uh, some were maybe um, a little bit uh, surprising. Yes. Yeah, so uh, maybe to also set us up for the for the discussion later, um, I would like to get into those uh, briefly. And uh, Michael, if I may turn to you, you know, so uh, what, what has come up as the main barriers in uh, mainstreaming cybersecurity and development so far? Sure thing, thank you, Teresa, for being our moderator and of course your hard work in preparing today's session. Uh, and Yasmin and I will reflect on this together, in fact, and uh, I think Yasmin and I have very similar takeaways from the, the consultations, which in a way speaks to a level of unanimity, both from a international organization actor and the private sector actor, the strength of the consultations and the, the, the common themes that are coming through time and again. Firstly, and Johan touched upon this, uh, it is abundantly clear that secure digital transformation is absolutely essential in our pursuit of the SDGs, and that's true in ways which weren't fully recognized when the SDGs were being drafted and scoped and agreed to well over a decade ago. And now as we're kind of on the cusp of the post-2030 agenda and not quite knowing what that will look like, that in many ways speaks to the timeliness uh, of this uh, project and helping to lay the groundwork for that. But even before we get to the post-2030 agenda, right now in today's interconnected world, it's obvious that secure, trusted, and inclusive digital infrastructure is the very foundation of economic and social development everywhere, actually, not just uh, low- and middle-income countries. However, that digital transformation journey also brings with it a huge range of inherent uh, cybersecurity risks, uh, particularly for nations and regions that may currently lack the necessary cyber resilience to counteract the ever-evolving cyber threats. So it's imperative to recognize that in order to empower and safeguard all societies from the mountain cybersecurity risks, we must, of course, proactively and comprehensively integrate cybersecurity principles into the digital development agenda. One recurrent theme which has clearly resonated throughout the discussions is the need for a collaborative and inclusive approach, as just exactly as Johan said. Uh, achieving the SDGs through secure digital transformation requires the active and engaged participation of various stakeholders, and that includes governments, uh, international organizations, the development community, industry players, and civil society, which necessitates the pooling of knowledge, expertise, resources, uh, because of course the magnitude of these challenges is just simply too vast to be tackled by one entity in isolation. I know that's a very common theme which we hear throughout the IGF. Uh, 
I think furthermore, the, the consultations have really underscored that capacity building in cybersecurity is not merely a desirable option, but an absolute imperative. And in some ways, that'll be music to, to Chris's ears, but uh, something that he or already knows and understands very, very well. Uh, it's evident that we need to prioritize efforts in, in building and enhancing uh, the capacity to manage and mitigate cybersecurity risks, especially in regions, again, where digital transformation is incur occurring at a, a really accelerated pace. Strengthening the skills and uh, the knowledge required to navigate the intricate web of cybersecurity uh, challenges is fundamental to the achievement of sustainable development goals. Additionally, the discussions so far have highlighted the importance of mainstreaming cybersecurity into digital development programs and funding mechanisms. So to ensure that the SDGs are not only supported, but indeed advanced by digital transformation, we must seamlessly integrate cybersecurity considerations into the very fabric of digital and development initiatives. And that includes both at the initial design level, but also ongoing implementation of these projects. And we've learned that the approach to mainstreaming cybersecurity uh, must be adaptable and context specific. Of course, there's no one size fits all solution. So every region and country faces a, a range of unique challenges and requirements on their digital development journey and as such strategies and interventions must be tailored to uh, address those specific contexts effectively. Lastly but certainly not least on the issue of funding mechanisms uh, that's clearly an issue that's come to the forefront. The consultations have illuminated the uh, critical need to broaden the sources of funding for cybersecurity capacity building. It's not sufficient to solely rely on defense budgets, for example, to support these endeavors, it is imperative that development budgets are also mobilized to ensure that digital development projects are fortified with the necessary cybersecurity components. So aligning funded mechanisms with the specific needs and objectives of digital development initiatives is essential too. I think these are just some of the valuable uh, insights from the consultation so far. Yasmin, I think we'll have similar perspectives and maybe more to share. I'll throw to you. <laughs> thank you so much, Michael, and thank you, Teresa. Um, so indeed, these consultations have also lifted the lid on some things that, as you know, cybersecurity practitioners, you don't necessarily consider. There's also a definition issue sometimes that we often try as a recommendation to uh, refer to it to s as cyber resilience, because security as a word is uh, implies certain things, of course, and um, this also co is partly caused by the fact that uh, cyber capacity building, as mentioned by Michael, is often uh, funded from defense budgets rather than development. So one recommendation also that has been coming uh, since th the two workshops that we've had is to demystify the field because actors, that be it development or policy, they often misunderstand it. Uh, they see it only as a technical issue or not a consumer issue or policy issue. Um, so there's a bit of a discomfort from development professionals uh, over the perceived sort of technical nature of it. And one other thing that is important that we often overlook is that it's a very English-focused um, um, field. Um, there needs to be a little bit more inclusion also in terms of languages and uh, both you know, national and also local dialects need to be reflected. Um, a recommendation that is important as well is to consider going beyond our usual sort of communities, both at national and international level. Um, the development you know, community and the cyber capacity building community often do not talk. And also at national level, there is often an interagency friction between mandates. And that's the case for numerous countries. So oftentimes we finish into a, an eco chamber of you know, speaking to cyber diplomats that obviously know the importance of this. But there needs to be, of course, the inclusion also of what we would consider non-traditional actors like uh, political parties or civil society, of course and people that are also active in shaping this policy landscape. Um, yeah, so including cybersecurity and cyber resilience is of course key to also include in digital development projects. So I can say that even in the ITU, the approach is still very siloed. Um, oftentimes we have digital development projects as one thing and then cybersecurity projects as separate even within the same organization. So I wouldn't imagine um, elsewhere so maybe a recommendation that has come out and th that I very much agree with is that sometimes cybersecurity can be added as a sort of criteria in um, audits for um, c uh, development projects, digital development projects. Uh, maybe donors can have a, a, a role here where they can uh, build cybersecurity requirements into their projects. So it's a bit of a all hands uh, on deck type of effort, um, but I think 
what's really key is to continue to have these conversations and maybe uh, you know turn over to um, different actors, maybe some that we haven't thought about for um, understanding some what can be some good examples that we can showcase through this work stream. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmin. Thank you, of course, also also Michael. You know, uh, um, I'm I will be curious later to uh, to hear if this to any extent was surprising uh, to you as well, and uh, if you have other reflections. But before we do, uh, Michael, you have mentioned, uh, for instance, uh, the unique challenges that there are various regions uh, face. Uh, Yasmin has brought up the issue also uh, of languages, uh, and uh, I would like to turn to you, Mokhtar. Um, you, of course, knowing uh, Africa so well, can you share with us a little bit your perspectives of um, kind of where the intersection of uh, digital uh, resilience and um, uh, you know achieving uh, uh, si uh, si sustainable development goals, um, uh, how it has uh, unfold in, uh, unfolded in Africa, and uh, what is uh, the situation there regarding the multi-stakeholder participation uh, that we've heard about uh, as quite an important need. So. 4 a.m. for you, good morning, but we hope you're fresh and ready to share something with us. Indeed. Uh, can you hear me very well now? Yes, we can. And do you see me? Uh, so far you're small, but I believe you will be made big. Ah, okay. <laughs> yes, it's perfect. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity, and uh, uh, good day to you, because it's the morning, and uh, it's uh, 4 a.m. here, uh, where I am in Mauritania. And uh, thank you for having me. And uh, I congratulate the previous speakers for what they have uh, contributed with, uh, specifically with regard to the um, connection between SDGs and the uh, cybersecurity and the ICTs in general. Uh, as it has mentioned previously, uh, today our lives is, uh, we cannot go without really uh, using the uh, digital technologies for our development and uh, this affects uh, a lot of our uh, goals with regard to the uh, uh, sustainable development. Uh, as previously mentioned, uh, the issue of safe transactions and the safe use of technology for development is extremely important. We have seen in the world the rise of uh, uh, cyber attacks, cyber threats here and there. And as mentioned also, uh, it is extremely important to see that cyber security is being addressed not only from security or defense point of view, but it is addressed from really safety and development and specifically sustainable development. Most of the African countries do have now their digital transformation strategies, but uh, uh, very few of them does not do not connect the digital transformation and the cybersecurity within uh, those uh, uh, approaches. Second, uh, most of the African countries, uh, or actually departments dealing with the digital transformation are most of the time addressing the issue of digital transformation in silo, which uh, though there is a multi-stakeholder um, approach everywhere, but the problem, the, the only point where the collaboration is not yet there is that national governance with regard to cybersecurity here. Most of the African countries are lacking that uh, collaboration among different stakeholders. They, the issue of cybersecurity is addressed by probably the ministers in charge of uh, digital transformation, the ICTs, and the ministers in charge of uh, security slash defense, but mm -hmm. other civil society, academia, and others as a multi-stakeholder are very seldom being associated or involved in this uh, uh, and over related to cybersecurity. So that lack of national governance with regard to cybersecurity slash connected with uh, the SDGs and connected with uh, the uh, digital transformation for, how can I say, uh, global approach for everybody to work on uh, together and 
make sure that uh, as uh, uh, the representatives of Sweden are said, uh, have said that we are all moving toward safety, uh, not only within the national borders, but also uh, outside of uh, uh, our borders in general. Uh, the, so the point here I wanted actually to highlight is the fact that the multi-stakeholders principle doesn't apply most of the time in the area of cybersecurity. That is one of the uh, number one. Number two, there is a lack of cyber strategy uh, at the national level. And you will see that uh, uh, most of the African countries um, do not have really uh, a very, uh, how can I say, efficient, if I may say, cybersecurity strategy associated with uh, development of digital transformation they're making together. There is an illusion of uh, safety with regard to buying uh, here and there firewalls or uh, antiviruses or whatever, and we think that is really the cyber safety, but in fact it's not. It's just what I call generally the illusion of safety. And the third one point I wanted to, uh, to, to highlight is that Africa has unique uh, specificity of having a lot, a lot of young people. Most of our 35 of our population has actually very young. And these people, if are very well used and uh, trained, they can be really the cyber guardian, not only for Africa itself, but also for all of us. Because uh, I said, uh, the issue of cyber security is not only within the national borders, but it's also for everybody. And our performance within that space or the cyberspace is just by the weakest link. So, uh, and Africa should not be really the weakest link in terms of that. So this, I stop here, is just as an introduction, but bottom line, um, it is extremely important that the multi-stakeholder principles be applicable also within the framework of cybersecurity. That is the main things. And Africa not should be a net consumer of products that are being manufactured here and there, but also uh, should create its own ecosystem in terms of uh, human capacities, in terms of uh, cyber uh, industry and cyber security industry in general. I stop here and I'll be glad to answer to your specific question. Over to you, Teresa. Uh, Mokhtar, thank you very much. Uh, you've been quite critical about the situation in Africa when regards to this topic, but you know, rest assured that uh, we have experienced um, these challenges, be it on the siloed approach uh, or um, um, maybe not as efficient uh, multi-stakeholder participation in other parts of the world. And that's uh, uh, also why we want to discuss it um, uh, here today. Um, so thank you. Uh, turning now to you, uh, Chris, uh, the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise um, has, uh, let's say, evaluated this topic uh, uh, of uh, cyber and development uh, intersection as quite vital or, or challenging to the extent uh, that it has decided to, alongside its partners to organize a major conference uh, on global cyber capacity building uh, that will be happening uh, at the end of November uh, in Accra, Ghana. Uh, so um, first of all, like why the angle uh, also for the GFC uh, and how do you expect these issues to be tackled uh, in the discussions there? <coughs> Thank you, Teresa. Um, and thank every uh, other speaker for their comments. I agree with what was said before, certainly. And I think it, it stems from what we've heard from the other panelists, that there is this divide between the traditional development community and the cybersecurity capacity building community, much like there's a divide between the traditional economic and innovation community and the security community on a larger scale. Uh, and I think it's partly misperception that they think of cybersecurity as too technical or uh, but a lot of development projects are technical. But on the other hand, I think they think it's a defense thing, it's a security thing. That's why, you know, for the conference we're having in Ghana, uh, the, it's, it's to bolster cyber resilience, and the term was chosen specifically really to address both of those communities. It's something that resonates with both, rather than using the term cybersecurity, which has resonance within this community, but maybe not that much resonance within the development community. And we've seen this play out in a lot of different venues. Uh, you know, a lot of countries think that cybersecurity capacity building is not, as they say, ODAable because they think it's a military thing. It's not. 
but that's the perception sometimes. Uh, we see even in the uh, negotiations in the UN, uh, I remember in the last, the first WWG, we wanted to get some language in saying that cybersecurity uh, undergirded the UN development goals, which indeed they do. Um, they may not mention cybersecurity as a separate goal or even digitization as a separate goal, but they undergird many of those, those goals and they're foundational to it. But there's a little bit of fear that, oh, the development goals are the province of not the first committee, but the second committee. And it's like, that's, you know, that's kind of crazy when you think about it because we're all in the same world and we all have to deal with these same issues. So the conference in Ghana, and I should emphasize it's not just a conference for Africa. It is being held in Africa. There'll be a, you know, significant African presence and participation, but as a global conference. It's for really all over the world. And really one of its chief goals is to bring together that traditional development community and the cyber community to, as uh, others have said on this panel, to mainstream cyber capacity building as a foundational element of development. Now we've seen some organizations, one of the co-organizers of this conference is the World Bank. We have the World Economic Forum, the World Bank, uh, the uh, Cyber Peace Institute and us, GFC. We also have a steering committee of a, a number of countries and organizations, including Microsoft. Um, and, uh, and, and so, there's there's this understanding that we need to mainstream this. We bring these communities together, and we've seen the World Bank, USAID, the British um, uh, Development Agency, I think, has been uh, on the front foot in the last few years in trying to do this kind of integration, but it's still rare, and that has implications in terms of, uh, you know, you were saying, for instance, that, as in that you know, digit digitization development projects obviously have a cybersecurity angle, but really almost every development project does, whether it's water, power, financial systems, almost anything foundational thing you can think of, uh, cybersecurity is important. So we want to bring these together. We want to build more understanding. We want to have something, an outcome coming out of this conference that is action-oriented, that really champions this integration and really brings it forward. This is a, you know, it's a conference. It's an important uh, marker, but it's really a process going after that to continue to make sure that people, uh, that we bring these communities together because it will make us both stronger. It will help the development community because if development projects go wrong because they don't have good cybersecurity, that hurts everyone. And uh, it will help the cybersecurity community because it opens, as others have said, more resources, more access, and more mainstreaming. So we're really looking forward to the conference. Um, it's a you know, big undertaking, but I think it'll be well worth it. And as I said, it's really the beginning or maybe the midpoint of a process rather than the end of a process. It's something which I think we're going to have to all persevere and continue to do. No, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, so, um, yes, uh, what I like that uh, you also presented it, that if these two worlds uh, interact a little bit more, uh, that it should ultimately be win-win. <laughs> it should be win for both uh, the development community and the cybersecurity community. I don't want to be perceived as saying that, hey, those development guys don't know what they're doing and they need to, they need to embrace us. We don't, we're not good at talking to the development community either. The, the, you know, the, the division lays on both sides. And so the idea of bringing us together is to, for both of us to move toward each other. And I think that's important. Thank you, Chris. No, totally. You know, how can we use the development language more? How can uh, the development community use the cybersecurity language more to understand each other better? Um, at this point, I would actually like to turn to you. Uh, I know I can recognize some faces in the room. I know many of you have been um, involved uh, also uh, in various development projects and maybe come across some challenges when it, uh, when it comes to cybersecurity or vice versa. You have been in cyber projects and maybe struggled uh, with uh, with linking it to some of the like bigger issue of international development. We really would like to hear from you. Uh, and please don't let us down because uh, this is important. Uh, and um, uh, I, I hope uh, it's in everybody's interest that uh, uh, you know the compendium we will publish or also um, you know any outcomes that will come from the GC3B, the Global Conference on Cyber Capacity Building, really make a difference, yes? Uh, so um, if I may ask you, uh, to not be shy and come to one of the micros um, not Microsofts, microphones. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't know you guys bought that. <laughs> <laughs> to the microphones around the room uh, and share with us some concerns. Uh, it would be excellent. Because if not, you will just be listening to us. 
Please, Patrick, if I may ask you. So this is Patrick Pavlak, uh, very closely involved in planning of the GC3B. So what do you have to tell us? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll break the ice and hopefully others will follow. So um, thank you for your presentations. I have a few comments that I think might be interesting as you move forward with, uh, with thinking about this project. Um, I've been involved with the European Union in a few projects that are linked on cyber capacity building, and I think one of them specifically might be relevant, which is uh, the trainings we've been doing with colleagues for um, the officials of the EU delegations around the world in different parts of the world. Uh, and that's specifically focused on cyber capacity building, but one of the big challenges that uh, we have seen while doing those training is that Diplomats are also more and more asked to engage not only on cyber projects, but also on digital issues. There is a lot of digital development projects, as you have said. And the challenge on the ground is that actually very often they do not really understand the difference. What is digital, what is cyber, and how do the two come together? So I think as you uh, conceptualize the project, and before you even go to the introductions, it would be probably very useful to explain how the two come together and you know where where the idea of the mainstreaming uh, sort of comes in because uh, that might uh, i mean that that very often poses um, uh, poses a challenge uh, the second thing maybe i would like to share and that's again from uh, another project that i've been involved in is um, the operational guidance on uh, cyber capacity building that we've been working on for the european commission and there we have really gone through the process of trying to think exactly how different aspects of cyber security can be reflected, taken on board in actually developing um, development projects. So here I think the, the European Commission and uh, the G International Partnership is actually one of the examples of this uh, development agency, if you want, that, is, um, that has actually quite a good understanding of those issues because that's the process we have started in 2017. We had the second edition of uh, of this operational guidance, but we are touching a lot of on a lot of the points that you have flagged. You know the importance of uh, con context, for instance. You know one of the key issues that uh, we found is important, but very often neglected in these discussions, is the importance of enabling environment. For instance, when we talk about cyber capacity building. And I think that's exactly where uh, mainstreaming and digital projects also come in, right? Because we very often say that the two are the, the, uh, the, the two are two sides of the same coin, and I think it will be important to uh, to reflect on those. The operational guidance I think is going to be uh, published before your report, so I think it might also be useful. But I'm happy to share uh, sort of a draft that we have had because we actually go in different direction, thinking uh, how cyber capacity building fits, so mainstreaming is one of them. There is uh, the, the risking approach that, that we are also looking at. Uh, so I think it might be interesting to think of how, how those different elements come together. But yeah, I'll start here, thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick, uh, for the excellent inputs and breaking the ice as well. Um, I think that uh, Johan is quite well placed uh, to tell us um, something on kind of the diplomats, you know, and how do you make the difference? Where is the line between cyber and development? Maybe Chris, then to you uh, on this like general question on what do we mean by mainstreaming uh, cyber and development? And please give me a sign, Michael or Yasmin, if you want to chip in later. Please, Johan. Uh, uh, yes, Patrick. Did I misinterpret you? No, no, you didn't, but maybe I'll give uh, one example that will make it uh, very, very concrete. So, for instance, during one of the trainings, uh, we got very specific question about blockchain, right? So, one of the colleagues said, you know, we are asked in the delegation to implement a project on blockchain in uh, the justice system. How does cybersecurity fit? How do we actually approach those topics? And then they say, you know, we are neither experts on blockchain, nor on uh, cybersecurity, so how can we actually manage that on the ground? And I think that's something that would be uh, very interesting to think about as well. Thanks, Patrick, uh, and for, for a very challenging question. I mean, I, I can just say that, I mean, I, I started out when on the cybersecurity side, um, in, 
spent many years in Brussels dealing dealing with the, with more the hardcore stuff on on the cybersecurity, and now I've been almost five years in Geneva, and that's the much more the digital uh, side of it. So so I've I can just agree very much with what was said. I think I think on the funding side, yeah. From a Swedish point of view, we are struggling a little bit because when I came, I uh, said, but why don't we fund? And uh, the answer I got, well, well they, these are y UN specialized agencies. They are not development agencies. So that's a problem. Uh, and, and I think w uh, w uh, what what you mentioned on, <coughs> on getting it together, yeah, it's a hassle and it's a challenge. What we have been doing now is we have set up a, a national security advisor in Sweden. And that's at the Prime Minister's office, so hopefully that will help us in integrating these things because it is tricky uh, to get this right. Uh, but I think what at least we can see from, from a national perspective and what we feel we in Geneva is that everybody understands that digital is a part of everyday life and it touches all aspects, so cybersecurity, or if you mean digital security, needs to be uh, needs to be integrated, and and I think from a Geneva perspective, I mean, yes, you have the hardcore cybersecurity stuff in the sense that you have the Cyber PC Institute working on on how to help implement cybersecurity for, for example, NGOs working in the humanitarian field. Uh, they have extremely sensitive data. ICRC ha suffered a major attack. Uh, also have, so, so there you have the link directly, but of course you also have the issue of, of digital security, if you would call it that, in, in how we deal with standards in, in the ITU and, and, and the ISO, in, in, and, so, and then of course we have the whole human rights angle, uh, which is also has security implications, because I think we talk a lot about bridging the digital divide, and we all need to do that, but I think the minute we get there, the first thing I want as a parent is that when my kids go online, that it is a safe and secure environment when they do that. And then for me, that we have trust, security, that the basic rights are respected uh, are for me as, as an individual very fundamental, and for Sweden it's fundamental, so that's why we think these, these are uh, f uh, things. But I think... The, the, the the getting the link right between between the development community and and uh, so to say perhaps the classical defense community, but I also think the economic community is is uh, something that we we are struggling with. So I'm not, uh, but but we are working on it. And I think the best thing we can do is to try to to build these kind of uh, networks and and try to work together. Um, and, and I have the privilege in, of being in, in Geneva and seeing that because, I mean, I also deal with e-commerce negotiations in WTO. So there we try to get those overall regulations that are key for getting trade flows and digital flows going. And we have language on uh, cryptography. We have language on cybersecurity in there. And yes, they will not be specific, but they will actually create that link to what is needed on, on, on more the implementation side. So I think we, we, we I see a closer and closer integration on it. Uh, uh, and, and I think what you have been doing, Patrick, is, is excellent, excellent because we need a lot of capacity building. Uh, and I think we all need that capacity building. Uh, and I think the importance of what you're making is that we need a holistic capacity building because we need to be able to explain what are the pieces, but also how the pieces link up. Thank you. No, thank you very much for this honest uh, assessment. Uh, Chris, if I may turn to you on the intersection uh, and you know what we mean by mainstreaming, and then over to Mokhtar. Uh, so I, I can give you a couple stories. I remember when I was at the White House and working at the National Security Council, we were doing the international US International Strategy for Cyberspace. It was the first international strategy on this topic that had been released by any country. Uh, but the National Economic Council people said, you can't call it that because it's about cybersecurity. And it's not about cybersecurity. It actually had elements of economics. It had human rights. In fact, we got a whole bunch of people in a room very much like this together from various agencies in the US government. And they didn't speak the same language. The human rights uh, folks used one set of words. Uh, 
internet policy people call it the, the internet, the security people call it cybersecurity. And so just getting those people in a room and meeting and talking together made us uh, release a strategy that really fulfilled that larger goal, a larger uh, go uh, goal with each of the, uh, their different areas feeding into it. Uh, so that was very helpful, just bringing those communities together. I remember you know, uh, going, for instance, to another country and we're talking about ITU meetings. And they said, oh, we don't go to ITU meetings. That's this other ministry. And so, uh, because that's telecommunications. But the, as you know, the ITU does much more than that. And so it, it's breaking down barriers within a country, within governments, within governments in the private sector, within the private sector itself, within civil society. I think it's really changing the way we think about this. And you know, we are seeing good glimmers of that. For instance, when I was at the State Department and started the Cyber Diplomacy Office, we weren't just about security. We had, we had a human rights component. We had a, uh, an economic component. Now that's been institutionalized. You know, in a number of countries, the cyber ambassador is also the digital ambassador. So that, that's a good thing. And I think that's one of the ways practically we need to bring this together. But we have a long way to go uh, to really make that a reality. And that helps us each see opportunities on the other sides that we haven't seen before. Thank you, Chris. Uh, First-hand experience from you. Yeah, that, and Johan was kind of smiling when you were speaking because I think you recognized uh, quite a lot also uh, happening in other, uh, in other governments. Uh, Mokhtar, over to you, please. Thank you, Teresa. And uh, actually, the, the question raised or the comment raised by Patrick is extremely important. Uh, in this part of the world, uh, Africa specifically, you can find a very an excellent diplomat. They know exactly about the geopolitics, what is happening here and there. And you have, uh, but they don't have anything. They don't know anything about techniques, technology. Uh, specifically, uh, they cannot even 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 they are very interested on that the uh, rapid pace of uh, uh, technology coming into our lives. It's actually for for non-technical person, it is very hard to follow on what's happening. And second, uh, you can find an excellent technical people who knows technology very well, but have no idea about the geopolitics and what is happening really in the area of diplomacy and so on. So even though they wanted really to, to be part of it, uh, the the transformations, the geopolitical transformation today make it also very hard. Uh, and I just give an example. We have reached this uh, a level of uh, development within the uh, digital space, thanks to uh, collaboration uh, among all of us, technology, industry. We, we have had that technical and technology cooperation that made us rate the humanity uh, advance. Today, we are seeing something that is different. We are seeing different technologies coming here and there and the restrictions here and there. And if, even I may say, um, we are moving a little more and more to already the digital divide in the sense that we do have different setups and technologies in every area of the world, which brings us, we are coming into the uh, cold technical war among the uh, biggest countries. Uh, hence, the smaller countries are just here following. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the few times here you will have to choose, shall I go by this system or that system or that technology or that technology? And you find the consumers that are those who don't have a technological ecosystem or uh, have the appropriate capacity, find them following and rather than carrying one or two phones, they will be carrying, you know, thousands of them are on their belts, you know, and just in order to be connected here and there. So that technological cooperation and that bridge between technical and diplomats and that continuous capacity building, not only continuous, it's a permanent kind of thing. This is something that has to be, capacity building is not one time, it's not a short period, it's something that is in permanently being addressed and need to be addressed because the technology are done so fast, so diverse, so integrated, mm -hmm. and so uh, machine oriented and controlled that uh, the, we need to make sure that we as a human being are there technically cooperating and also really pushing for uh, 
the technological cooperation for the safety of all. I stop here. Apologize. Uh, thank you very much, Mokhtar. Uh, yes, I know we have a comment online. Uh, then I will go to Yasmin, then then to you, Michael, okay? Uh, so, um, Alan uh, Sabanlong uh, would like to give us some uh, perspectives from the ASEAN region, joining us from the Philippines. Over to you. Uh, hello, uh, Theresa, and hello, everyone. Yes, uh, this is a very, very nice discussion, and just in time, because most of countries here in ASEAN are gearing towards digital development. But however, uh, with, the, with disruptions, ransomware and everything, these developments are affected. So in an increasingly digitized world where our lives are intertwined with technology, uh, there's a need to have a robust cybersecurity governance, if I may say. The rise of the digital age has ushered uh, unparalleled convenience but it has also exposed us to unprecedented risk. So to achieve this a seamless digital governance and avert potential dis disruptions, it is imperative that we prioritize cybersecurity governance as a top priority. No? And uh, in ASEAN, uh, based on experience, um, leaders are not uh, interdisciplinary. Uh, as as uh, we have said, uh, most of uh, the, the leaders in the government or in some uh, air, areas in ASEAN uh, only understands a single um, expertise. No? For example, if you are the policy guy, but you are not a technical guy. But I believe what we need uh, to achieve uh, digital transformation and secure digital landscape is to have an interdisciplinary leader who understands all aspects of cybersecurity and as well as the digital uh, aspect of development. So I believe um, without proper cybersecurity governance, organizations and governments are akin to sailing without a rudder in the treacherous waters, leaving themselves exposed to potentially catastrophic consequences. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you very much, uh, Alan, uh, for that. Yes, and uh, I mean, yes, it comes down to people uh, very often. That's why we've also uh, brought up the issue of cyber capacity building uh, and capacity building in general uh, so often in the session. So thank you for reconfirming that. Uh, just to have an idea uh, how many more comments in the room we will have to plan one. Very good. So quick reflections or uh, to Yasmin, uh, quick reflections to Michael. And then we go over to you, sir. Yes. Uh, if um, uh, if it's a, you want to go in now, yeah. okay. Please go ahead then. Uh, I'm from the government of Sri Lanka. I'm a civil servant, and I served in New York as a diplomat. By the time the SDG was formed, I was part of the open working group. Uh, I knew that it is challenging to to internalize everything under SDGs. Uh, but when it comes to development practicing and and uh, funding partnership side, uh, I'm not sure whether the development. Uh, ODA community is looking into this aspect and uh, what portion should be allocated in the, in the budgeting and planning on critical information infrastructure. Is there a particular guideline for certain uh, uh, fund seekers and other, other partners or if there is a formula or something that can work around this, I think it would be helpful. So Sri Lanka, we adopted the uh, cybersecurity strategy and uh, developed the cybersecurity policy as well. Uh, but these things have to go into the uh, standard organizational structures as well as uh, periodic development projects as well. That's my comment. Excellent question. Thank you very much for that. Uh, for everybody's information, we have about seven minutes left. Yasmin, Michael, Johan, maybe to share with us what comes next, uh, and then 20 seconds for wrap up. Uh, so let's reflect <laughs> shortly. Thank you. I'll make sure to be very brief. Thank you for your question. So definitely there needs to be thinking of cybersecurity in development projects. And I'm always sort of adamant in trying to look into other fields for lessons learned and not reinvent the wheel. So we can look into climate, for example, in climate negotiations, because it's also highly technical. It's also quite, there's a specific expertise and it might be very much uh, intimidating for uh, you know policy people, diplomats. Um, but now there's this understanding that it's obviously highly interlinked with de de development as well. So 
let's look also into other, you know, lessons learned from other fields. I mean, holistic views of governance are not something new. And so I think it can be done in cybersecurity as well. Totally agreed. Michael? Sure thing. Thank you. So just a quick reflection on Patrick's example and the colleague from Sri Lanka as well. Patrick, your example of the diplomat being asked to, uh, you know, work on a project related to blockchain in judiciary. We've seen the, uh, the, the digitization of court systems. In some contexts, you will see donor agencies and development practitioners use things like a needs assessment and a feasibility assessment and an impact assessment. Surely, based on these discussions, we should end up in an endpoint whereby there is uh, a real assessment of the, the cyber feasibility and the cyber needs and, the, and the, the cyber impacts. Chris mentioned the institutionalization of human rights. It took a long time to get to that point, but we've seen that in those sorts of processes or variations of those processes. Hopefully, we can end up in a similar point with cyber too. And the colleague from Sri Lanka, the question on budgets, I think it's important to have a, a mindset whereby we don't think of cybersecurity as a cost, but as an investment, the one that pays dividends over many years to come. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, you know, I'm afraid that the time is really ticking. Uh, so, um, Johan, may you share with us uh, briefly what are the next steps uh, of the consortium of the project? Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think it was a very, very useful discussion. Um, we take this with us. Uh, we will have another consultation coming up in Singapore. And the aim that we are hoping is to produce uh, I little guidance for this uh, by December, uh, so that will be um, something that we hope to be able to consolidate your points uh, in a way that is useful so we can take this issue forward. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Johan. Uh, if any of you do happen to be uh, attending the Singapore uh, International Cyber Week, next week, uh, please let us know uh, so that we make sure uh, to invite you uh, to a consultation that will be taking place more in the kind of Southeast Asian um, uh, context, you know, uh, please do let us know. Uh, coming up next uh, will also be a session uh, at the GC3B, and as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we hope uh, publishing the compendium uh, in December. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank all of you uh, for listening, uh, to all of you who have shared uh, your experience uh, with us, um, uh, to uh, online uh, Mokhtar uh, and Alan uh, for, uh, for all of your inputs, and uh, here in the room uh, to Chris, Yasmin, uh, Michael, and Johan. Uh, have a good rest of the IGF and see you around. Thank you.